right. Oh, there hey, he is. Oh, there I am. All Sorry right. about that. The great Ralph Garman. Yay! Yay, indeed. Yay, me. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Ralph, on uh, the podcast, you said something that really struck me because I've been listening to the radio for years and I thought I knew what I was doing. But you said that you're playing a character on the radio. So please tell me about that. It's, of course, you're called Ralph Garman, but it is a character. So well, how is that different from the real Ralph Garman? I don't know if it's a character per se, but anytime you're performing for an audience, whether it's as yourself, technically, you know, if you're doing a radio show or a podcast, um, you are obviously doing a, a version of yourself. You're trying to use the parts of yourself that you find you think will be found entertaining by the audience. You're not going to be your, your truest self because that's often boring. So um, what you do is you find aspects of yourself that you can amplify or play up for comic effect. And I found that I've done that in every project that I've been involved with where I was supposedly myself, whether it was on K-Rock or with uh, Kevin Smith, with Hollywood Babylon or at the Ralph Report, you're doing a slightly exaggerated version of some aspect of yourself. And hopefully the folks find that entertaining. So that's what I mean by a character. I'm not, I haven't invented this guy named Ralph Garman. I'm not Andy Kaufman, but um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an exaggerated version of me, I guess. One of our favorite things is angry Ralph. Yes. So I think that's something you exaggerate <laughs> and you're very good at it. Thank you. I have always been a fan of uh, comedy that's based in ridiculous levels of anger, whether it's uh, Lewis Black or uh, Kevin Meany. And there was a bunch of comedians who sort of... Kevin Meany? You mentioned him on your podcast today, too. That guy's coming up more and more. Put your big pants on. Get your big pants. You're a big pants person. Just, I found that people who get really aggravated and agitated in an exaggerated way, that's always been funny to me. So I've always uh, kind of used that in my bag of tricks as well. Well, it works. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so. So you didn't hate Beam when you yelled at him all those times? Um, not every time. <laughs> not every time. No, with Bean, it was, you know, that's a perfect example of taking an exaggerated aspect of a relationship or a personality or something and then just you know blowing it out into comic proportions so bean would do something that was slightly annoying and i would overreact to it in the hopes of uh, making something funny out of it i've always wondered did you guys ever plan anything did you ever say hey i'm going to say this weird thing bean would say i'm going to talk about the post office and you would say i'm going to riff on that or was it just all kind of like improv um, the stuff that was actual interaction between myself and Kevin and Bean, um, when, when it was in the room, that was usually on the fly, just a reaction to what was ever being said. But when we did the character bits, you know, we would do a wheel of, a wheel of bad animal voices, or if I would call in as a, a character or something, we would usually have a loose kind of, um, a set of bullet points, maybe things we wanted to cover. And then as the conversation went on, I would just sort of riff off of those things. Early on, when I started, I used to write out scripts for Kevin and Bean and myself very early on, because I, I realized quickly that that wasn't their thing. You know, they weren't actors, they were they were broadcasters. And I found it was much more successful when I let them just interview me uh -huh. as they would any anybody else and i'd give them maybe a couple things that i wanted to touch on and then the rest was just all improvised so we've been listening obviously to the old kevin bean as well and one of the things that kind of blows us away is the rock me amadeus always room for j-lo <laughs> <laughs> like how did that i mean i understand how the j-lo one came about but how did the other one that kind of spun off and kept going and how did that come about uh good question uh besides Irrational anger as a as a comic device. I also found great pleasure in doing bad puns or or what they call uh, shaggy dog stories, where you have like a long setup for a silly or ridiculous sort of punchline or a punny punchline. Um, I enjoyed doing those in direct proportion to how much it annoyed Kevin or Bean, and um, the more they got annoyed by it or, or got frustrated with me the funnier I would think it was. And so that's how those things became recurring segments because of the groans that it would elicit from those guys when I finally got to 
you know, a Rock Me Amadeus or um, what were the other ones? I, I, the Bugatti oh, one. How did the Bugatti one come about? Because that seemed kind of anti K Rock in all ways. Several of them that became sort of those running gags were um, either suggested from emails from the audience or sort of came up in conversation. And um, often, you know, I would, I would, as I do with the Ralph Report, as I do with Hollywood Babylon, I comb through the, the emails and the voicemails and the stuff that we get from the audience because it's an endless source of great material. Pe people will hear things or catch things that you don't necessarily notice because you're too busy in the moment. Stuff flies by you. So um, I think the Bugatti one actually came from an email that somebody sent in because people would start to send in either Rock Me Amadeus or um, what was the other one we used to do all the time? Blinded Me With Science. You blinded Me With Science, yeah. Or either Catherine Wood would come nice. up. Catherine Wood would come up with one or, or uh, you know, I'd get an email from a listener. So I think Bugatti was, uh, was from a listener, actually, now that I think about it. So was the goal sometimes to get everyone in the room to crack up? That or to get them really infuriated with me, like when I would try to sing the entirety of Bye Bye Miss American Pie uh, whenever it was Don McLean's birthday. Um, <laughs> invariably, we'd get a, I'd get a, a minute in and people would start to lose their minds. And that just always was funny to me. Did you have a favorite of all those running gags? Was it Rock Me Amadeus or Bugatti or Blinded Me With Science? I think Amadeus probably because I believe that was the the OG. I think that was the one that kind of started that whole uh, gag off. And plus, I'm mean, just a huge fan of that song. So it was always fun for me to to, to play with those words. But uh, science was a close second. I tried and tried to get a Rock Me Amadeus email in. I never could. I think I tried <laughs> to bribe you too. Ralph's well, a man of principle, people. He wouldn't take my money. It got ridiculous. I mean, I had a stack like this on my desk in the office at K-Rock of people suggesting stuff. So I would, you know, get through as many as I could. But there were a lot that went unused. And there were it wasn't a you know, commentary on the quality. It was just it was just overload. Uh, so a lot of those voice characters you did, like the Christian Bale one, that one, I think, came up that day. So did they just give you some of those uh, bits on the spot on that morning? Yeah, um, rarely, luckily for me, but there would be things happening in the news in the moment where they would turn to me and say, can you whip something up, you know? And so um, I would do my best to varying degrees of success, but I found with Christian Bale that luckily the, the timber of his voice was very similar to my own. And if I just replicated sort of the pattern and the volume of that snippet from him uh, losing his mind on the set that I got pretty close to it pretty quickly. So we, uh, we got a lot of play out of that early on. And then of course, Bale called in himself, which was one of the highlights of my life. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> so one of my favorite bits um, is when, whenever somebody, you know, you're about to announce something or a person and then things kind of descend into chaos of the drop war. So I have a little clip. This particular instance was when Jimmy Kimmel was announced as the host of the Oscars. It's very short, so. For this year's Oscar telecast. Be real. Is it be real? It is not. Is a gentleman we like to call? The Louisiana Creeper. Not the Louisiana Creeper at all. In fact, the Jesus. host, this is not Jesus oh. this year. Flavor, mm -hmm. flavor. Nope. Johnny asshole. Got so this lasted for a good uh, six more minutes, I believe. Um, really? So, was it that long? Yeah. It's one of the great drop wars, I would say, in history. And I think Jimmy Kimmel actually tweeted about it and was like, thanks, guys. Um, so when that <laughs> happened, like, was that planned or was that just something that they did to annoy the crap out of you? Yeah, that was, you know, turnabout is fair play. And they often, when I had a name to announce, especially Bean, who had just racks and racks of, of sound drops at his disposal he would start burning through uh, uh, uh you know his collection of just names and the, the more they interrupted me the, and the, the funnier it got obviously and uh, i don't know if that's the one or not where i sort of dissolve into tears uh, in, of laughter as well but there were many times where it just got so ridiculous and the names that he would pull out would be so ridiculous that it just got silly yeah, it's it's pretty great. I think Count Smokula might be one of my favorites <laughs> as, a, as a Rodney drop. All um, right. <laughs> oh, nice. Now, 
I, I will mention that there was someone who was playing the drop wars before it was cool. Let's see if you remember this clip. Mere days before everyone else. <laughs> Thanks so much. My my daughter's enjoying my sound effect machine. Over here. Okay. Get one for, uh, for <laughs> playing a keyboard cat. You're playing me off with the keyboard cat. Let's get to celebrity. So <laughs> that was 2012, the first time you ever had your daughter in, and she just started smashing the buttons. So yes. I think she started a trend. Two year old Olivia just thought it was fun just to push the buttons that were in front of me. So uh, that was both. That was fun. Did you ever have a guest that came in that you were kind of like, meh, whatever, and then all of a sudden they just blew you away and you were just amazed by them? Wow. Uh, no, there were some that I had heard perhaps um, bad things about or that it had been warned about, and they mm -hmm. turned out to be just charming and wonderful and lovely, uh, which was always a pleasant surprise. And then I had the contrary as well, where... Uh, you look, really look forward to meeting someone and then they end up either having a bad morning or uh, it, the interaction is not what you expected. But for the most part, I'm trying to think of anybody came in who really, it, you know, who I can think of one. We had Tom Cavanaugh in and Tom Cavanaugh, if you don't know, is uh, currently on the flash on CW and he was on a show called Ed. And I think he, maybe he came in for the flash the first season. And I was a fan of his work as an actor, but I didn't know what a huge personality he was and how funny he was. And that was really a, a pleasant surprise to be sort of um, blown back by his energy a little bit. And I remember when Shatner came in, I'd always heard, you know, be careful around Shatner. He's very prickly and he can be a real pain in the ass. And boy, was he just charming and fun and uh, chatty. And we had, a, I had, I had spent a lot of time with him before we even got on the air and he was enormously kind to me and very friendly so that was a pleasant surprise too who was like one of the most lasting relationships that came out of that besides kevin smith because we all know we all know that was a yeah relationship. right kevin and i met uh because of his being on the show um adam west my longtime friend adam west was a was one of those folks who i had met briefly prior to him being on the show but it really was his uh, visits on k-rock that uh, was the, the spark of our friendship as well um jason biggs comes to mind uh jason schwartzman oh, wow wow other guys named jason <laughs> um i'm trying to think who else did i sort of uh, hit it off with uh stone street eric stone street became uh, friends of mine a friend of mine through that uh john crier i think that's about it in terms of guests that, that i've had sort of uh, friendships with that lasted beyond just their, their time on the show. What about Charlize Theron? Yeah, Charlize, uh, we have a, I'd like to consider it a friendship. <laughs> she probably considers it an acquaintanceship or, or just annoying. But um, <laughs> no, early on, of course, when she came on a bunch, we, we got to be friendly. And then again, we worked together in a, a movie called A Million Ways to Die in the West that Seth MacFarlane did. And I was blown away when we got to the, the table read for that script, how we picked it up like we had just seen each other yesterday. I mean, she was a huge Kevin and Bean fan back in the day, and she was always so friendly and nice to me, and we had a great time making that movie. But I was kind of suppressed, impressed and surprised that she uh, remembered me as, as, as fondly as she did. She seems very nice. She is a sweetheart. She is a doll. And I can only reconcile that with the fact that she is not American. <laughs> <laughs> because I found that women who look like that in show business who are American tend to have a sense of entitlement about them. And because she's South African and comes from such a great um, mom, who's also very grounded and very real, I think, uh, I think the way she was raised aff affected how she treats people very much. So I've never seen her uh, be anything but kind to anyone, whether it was on a set or a fan interaction or anything like that. Who is the one you did shots with? Shots with Shahi? Who oh, that? Sarah Shahi. Yeah, That's yeah. another another friend uh, that I made out of uh, out of the Kevin and Bean show. And you know, these guys have all been great to me too. With the Ralph Report too, they've all at one time or another yeah. come on and done an interview uh, with me because when I was first starting out, especially, I was trying to get as many eyes on the show as possible, and they were all very accommodating. And uh, Sarah was a great interview, and we still touch base, you know, through social media and stuff. I don't get no one's seen anyone the past year and a half but uh 
uh, we would we would uh, hang out occasionally. And she's another one who's just a doll, just could not be kinder and sweeter. One thing that I always related to you is you grew up a comic book geek, like I did. And for years, of course, we were mocked for it. And then one day, comic book movies became the coin of the realm, the biggest thing ever. How sweet was it to be able to rub Kevin and Bean's noses in it? You know, it's funny. Um, Seth Green always says that every time I see him, he's like, remember how Kevin and Bean used to make fun of us because we went to Comic-Con in San Diego and, oh, the gathering of the nerds and what a bunch of losers. And then suddenly, a couple years later, they were broadcasting live from San Diego <laughs> Comic-Con. And he said, you know, we were cool before they knew it. And yep. it's a running joke, but it's true. I mean, it, it suddenly, you know, the nerds took over pop culture and, and uh, we became the focal point and, and Comic-Con certainly did as well. So, yeah, Kevin has apologized to me both personally and professionally several times about that because he's like, yeah, you were right. And we were wrong. <laughs> well, I remember they used to mock you to go to for going to Comic Con, like you said. And then one year they're like, "Ralph, we want to go. We want to come to the panel you're doing." And you're like, "Nope." <laughs> and just shot him <laughs> down. It was great. And, and that's where the whole vice bus incident happened at the Comic Comic Con, right? Where the you witch? had the part, the vice bus, where Kevin got on the vice <laughs> yeah. bus. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin was going to be my plus one at a uh, big IMDB function that Kevin Smith was hosting on the boat there off of uh, San Diego. And he really wanted to go to this party and we were going to get interviews with people that were there and stuff. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting and, you know, for him to show up so I could get on. He was my plus one. I had to walk him in. And he got on the, uh, the vice bus and got stoned with those guys and was driving around San Diego while I was waiting for him. But he was the worst texture in the world, Kevin. Still is to this day, by the way. Yeah. So it was like vice bus, 20 men or whatever. I couldn't <laughs> figure out what he was trying to tell me. But he was trying to say he was on the vice bus, not the vice bus, but Kevin being Kevin. And with that, with you working with Kevin and being to have different personalities and Kevin Smith has a different personality, and Eddie Pence, how do you navigate between all those different personalities and just still manage to be hilarious? Well, it's like I was saying earlier, you use different aspects of yourself in different situations, right? So I'm a very different person with Kevin Smith than I was with Kevin and Bean. And I'm different again with Eddie because I, I just tend to react to whatever they're giving me, you know, and um, Kevin and Smith and I have a very unique sort of comedy team energy where he plays the cuddly stoner and I'm sort of the uh, angry drunk. And then <laughs> with Eddie, you know, he's the he's the lovable goof off. And I'm the guy who likes giving him the business all the time. And with Kevin and Bean, I always felt like I was sort of the uh, the petulant teenager to their mom and dad in a lot of ways. Uh, that was the dynamic that we kind of played up on the show. So it you just try to stay open to whatever the other person is giving you. It's just it's just a good rule of performing in general. Just kind of use what you what you're given and, and make the best of it. So we know you came up through acting. Um, did you do voiceover work before Kevin and Bean or did that become something you did because of Kevin and Bean? I had always done voices and accents and things like that when I was doing sketch and improv comedy, but in terms of doing it professionally in terms of animation or anything like that, um, really it started with, um, with K-Rock with the, the Kevin and Bean show. That's the first time I started professionally doing the, the voices. I mean, again, the reason Jimmy Kimmel thought I'd be a good fit for the show was that he had seen me do sketch and improv when I was doing celebrity impressions and character voices and stuff. And he said, this is all completely applicable for uh, for morning radio. So that's why he sort of convinced Kevin and Bean to give me a shot on their show when he and Adam left to go do the man show. And so the first time I've really, you know, leaned into that was Kevin and Bean show. And then because of the, what I was doing on that show, that's how the casting director for family guy called up the station one day and said, we're doing um, a bit about the Dustin Hoffman. And I heard you just do rain man. Could you come down and audition for it? And so I did. And Seth liked what I was doing. And that's how I started working on family guy for over 15 years now. <laughs> nice. I have a um, question about the family guy thing. Yeah. You're always playing the heavy. You're the cop. You're the FBI agent. Why can't Ralph be the funny guy we know? I want Mayor Ralph Garman. 
When Adam West passed away, that's the character we need. Tell Seth to get on that. Like that's Sam Elliott now. There's no beating Sam Elliott when it comes well, to voice. I think voices. the Ralph dog can. Um, the Ralph dog. Um, here's the thing. Here's a trick. Talk about you know using something specific that that makes someone laugh. Seth MacFarlane loves me when I yell. That is his favorite thing to make me do. And he likes it when I'm stern and angry. And either that's on Family Guy. And then when he put me in Ted, he had me play um, Mark Wahlberg's character's father in the very beginning when Ted first comes alive, solely because he loved me screaming what I scream. I don't know if this is a PG show or a G show or how you guys work here, but. Go crazy. Oh. Or triple X. <laughs> no, no, we're not. Not triple X. <laughs> this, this is our OnlyFans page. Um, oh god but jesus h fuck you know when the bear comes alive <laughs> screaming that at the breakfast table seth thought that was hilarious and then in a million ways to die in the west he has me scream that's a dollar bill boy take your hat off and he just he loves it when i yell he finds that very funny so well when he casts me in his various projects almost always i am angry and yelling about something because he just thinks like, <laughs> it just makes him laugh Talking back about Eddie Pence, um, we thought a lot about how he compares to the radio personalities that you worked with. I think in terms of his taste in food and or his mastering of the English language, he's a lot like Kevin. Um, but how do you how do you think he's like a lot of your older coworkers and also Steve? He is uh, unique to himself, I think, Eddie. He is he's. Although it's funny now that I I never thought about it this way, but he is quirky like Bean in the sense that he's very specific about what he likes and doesn't like and it and um, doesn't necessarily match the rest of the world or, or, or certainly me. But you're right. Sometimes his his malaprops or his way he says a word or screws it up or something is sort of Kevin esque. So he's got a little Kevin and Bean, I think, in him. And then Steve Ashton. Um, for, for me, pound for pound is usually the funniest thing on the show. Nobody makes me laugh harder than Steve Ashton does. He's just so witty and dry and articulate and British, which I'm just a sucker for British comedy anyway, that I just I just love to sit back and laugh when he's on the show. So um, we got a real good crew. It's, it's funny how it all kind of fell together. And, um, you know, now, we're, now that we're in our third year, third plus year, it's just... Um, it's really fun to see how the thing has sort of grown and everyone sort of found their niche. Speaking of that, when you started the podcast, did you have any idea of like, okay, I'm not going to do old stuff. I'm not going to do like Wheel of Bad Animal Voices or characters. How did you decide what you were going to do and what you weren't going to do? I didn't have a lot of luxury of time to figure any of that out. You know, I got fired in November of 17. And we were up and running in January, January of 18. So it was just a couple months before I had to kind of throw the show together and get it up and running. And I knew I wasn't going to be doing any of the stuff from K-Rock because I couldn't. I mean, I didn't have Kevin and Bean there. I didn't have Omar to help me with the audio production stuff that needed to be done. I, I didn't know what the show was going to be, quite frankly. I started it off saying, well, let me just get on. And I'll start by myself and maybe that will be different enough and, and unique enough from the stuff I had done because I'd worked with two guys on the radio and one guy in podcasting before with Kevin Smith. But I said, let me see what I can do on my own and see if that, I don't know, maybe there's something there that I haven't explored. And when I got into it pretty quickly on, uh, early on, people who were listening said, you know, this is fine, but you're really much better when you have someone to bounce off of. And when you have someone to riff with, you should think about finding someone to join you. And that's when I started really thinking about adding a second voice to the show. And that's how uh, Eddie came along. Would you ever consider adding more people if the if, if the shoe fit? Oh, sure. Yeah. The more the merrier. Um you know, some of my favorite moments have been when Steve Ashton is in town for if we're doing a live show or something and he'll get a chance to sit in with us while we're recording uh, the show. And it's enormously fun. The more funny people you have in a room, I think the better off you're going to be. But podcasting is a different animal than than radio, for example, because, you know, I work out of my home and the schedule is 
variable and it's all over the place because you're trying to accommodate different people's schedules. So, I mean, you guys must know just trying to get, get together to, to do a show and get everyone's <laughs> schedule ironed out and figure out when people can make it and when they can't. It's a big undertaking. So the fact that another reason Eddie was a godsend is because being a stand up when he does work, he works late at night usually. So his days are pretty flexible. So we're able to work that scheduling issue out. So to find one or two more people who were equally flexible in terms of when they could work, I think would be a challenge, but I, I, I'm open to anything on the Ralph Report. And that's kind of been the fun thing is to watch it grow and evolve and some things fall away and some new things start up and things go through cycles. And it's, it's this living creature that, that, that's so much fun to put together. Yeah, it's wonderful how you have a lot of listener participation Yes. You have uh, Jen that does a lot of songs. and It's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, that's a really cool aspect where it just builds on that into your show and you put it in there. You know, that is a carryover from Hollywood Babylon because uh, when Kevin Smith and I started doing that show, we always did it in front of a live audience. We started doing it um, in a theater, a little theater on Santa Monica Boulevard, and then it grew to larger and larger rooms. And, and now we mostly do it at the Improv in, in West Hollywood. Or we take it on the road and we've played to, you know, we were in, in London and played to 5,000 people. It was insane. It was like a rock show. But early on in that process, we would get emails from people and people would send in audio and they'd send in pictures for us to put up and video clips. And there was such a um, exchange of content and talent that I, I recognized that for the Ralph Report, I absolutely wanted to lean into that too. And I opened it up and said, if you got an idea or you got something you, you want to share, send it. And if it's good, uh, you know, I'll put it up. And that I think fostering that atmosphere of sort of community has made the show much more than I ever could have hoped. Yeah. I was going to ask, like, did you, did you envision for both HBO and for the Ralph report that, that your fans would have this much of an effect on your show? No, it was accidental in both cases, but I'm not an idiot. And so, you know, <laughs> when, when, it's, when it's working and you start to recognize how much talent is out there and how generous people are with that talent and they're willing just to give you gold, you'd be a fool not to say, oh, I get it. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to encourage this and I'm going to take advantage of it because it's, it's amazing. And let's face it, it makes my life easier because the more great stuff I'm able to call from emails or, or voicemail messages or whatever, uh, you know, it's one less thing that I have to worry about trying to, to come up with. And I, I end up being sort of like this conductor where you've got this orchestra of things going on and you're able to pull from all these different areas. And plus it fosters this community. People get a kick out of hearing themselves in a show or hearing their friends in a show. And it, um, the Garmy that has uh, evolved out of this show is a remarkable group of supportive, loving, caring people who are there for me and the show, but for each other. And that has been the biggest surprise for me. And alternately, the most satisfying part of this is to watch the, 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 the human aspect of, the, of what has come out of the Ralph Report for me is just, it, I get choked up because it's just, I say this often, they, they continually, you know, reaffirm my belief in humanity in, in a time where if you're reading social media or watching the news, you could think otherwise, they, they remind me that there's a lot of good people in the world. And, and I'm very lucky. Yeah, we were talking about that because we all met on the Kevin and Bean social club. And your page and like the cup of tea page, you're right, they're, they're a community. And they're yeah. there for each other. Like, I remember one time someone on your page had a, a problem. I think it was with um, drinking or something. And the community like came together and you and you like you helped him out of his problem. So you're right. It becomes a really big community that people are there for each other. Yeah. And that's the most gratifying part of the whole thing. It's nice to have um, success in terms of listeners or to make a make a buck, you know, in this business is not easy. So that's obviously satisfying. But the true joy of it has come for me out of, out of watching the people interact with each other and me getting to interact with them as well. You know, the, I, I would notice when I was working on the Kevin and Bean show, 
it's a, it's a different animal because you're on at the time often we were the number one show in the number one radio market in the country and you're talking about millions of people it's too big a number you can't interact with those people and radio especially is, is very much a one-way street i mean you're doing your thing and people are listening in their cars or something but you don't really know whether it's resonating or not so occasionally i'd be out in the world at acoustic christmas or or april foolishness and i then i would get to have interaction with the people who listen to the show that's when i would get feedback but with hollywood babylon and certainly with the ralph report it's a constant thing. You know, I'm always reading the emails and I'm always listening to the voicemails and I'm meeting people all the time. And it just, it's a more intimate experience for me. And that has made it more satisfying in a lot of ways. Um, so when you talk about your social media interactions um, from between now and when you're on the radio, do you, I hope you're dealing with a lot less garbage humans now. <laughs> <laughs> Much less. Yes. Good. The, uh, the, the listeners, both of uh, Babylon and the Ralph Report are almost exclusively loving and positive. And for whatever reason, uh, K-Rock had a lot of people who were, um, not angry, but, uh, you know, you're dealing with a lot of different opinions and a lot of different tastes, and you couldn't make everybody happy, obviously, but uh, we made a lot of people unhappy, it seemed like to me. We were got, <laughs> I got a lot of complaints from a lot of people about a lot of different things. There wasn't any one thing I could stop doing and make the hate stop because everybody okay. hated something different. So um, I guess that comes from the fact that it's a radio station, and it's not just the Kevin and Bean show. You got, you know, Cat Corbett fans who are listening or you've got Rodney Bingenheimer fans who are listening or people who just like the music and don't care for the personalities so much. So it, that's a that's a real mixed bag that you're dealing with a lot of personalities out there in the listening audience. So, yeah, it's it's much easier to interact with with this audience because people don't like me. They're probably not showing up to listen to the show. So <laughs> I'm already ahead of the game. And there were people who loved Kevin and Bean and hated me or loved Bean but hated Kevin or vice versa and you know we couldn't it was hard to find somebody who who was made happy by everything we did and that's why I like that bit you do where you read the exit survey <laughs> the angry exit <laughs> interview yeah. yeah that's painful I'm glad you enjoy it but it's painful <laughs> well you, you seem to have a fun with it too no I'm kidding it does it's actually it is uh very cleansing to be able to say that stuff out loud it hurts less when I put it into a bit and we do it on the show, then it, then it does when I just read it quietly to myself in my room. Uh, it's better to, to expose it to sunlight and just purge it that way. So no, it is, it's, it's a fun bit, which I stole from Jimmy Kimmel. And I've personally apologized to him. And he's given me permission, so it's okay. <laughs> well, we steal everything we do, so <laughs> don't much, feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we do. On that note, what was some of the most ridiculous shit that came down from corporate when you were at K-Rock? Oh, God. You don't have enough time for this <laughs> list. <laughs> we, it, got, it got worse and worse, too. By the time I was finally let go, as much of a shock and as, as painful as it was, it was almost a relief because the suits, as they're known, and the lawyers and the consultants they would bring in, we were being just micromanaged to death and it was really disheartening by the end but you know it started my very first week on the job mr weatherby our uh, program director said i don't want to hear you on the air unless you're doing a voice and i was like okay and he said you can't talk to kevin and being on the microphone as you because nobody knows who you are and I was like, how is the audience going to find out who I am if I don't get on the microphone and do some talking? And he's like, no, I don't. I never want to hear you be you. You're only going to be characters and celebrities. And I was like, OK. And then Kevin and Bean were like, that's insane. We, you know, why don't you come on and, and as yourself? And that's where we came up with the showbiz beat, because, you know, Jimmy was. You know, sold to the audience as the sports guy. But in reality, he was doing voices and writing all, a ton of material and coming up with games and stuff. He was, he was a creative force on that show. So they said, we need to find you a niche that we can you know, put your name on so that it gives you a reason for living. And then you can do all the other stuff uh, behind the scenes. So 
I said, well, I'm not really a sports guy, so I can't take over that job. But, you know, I'm pretty well versed in showbiz news. So maybe I could do an entertainment news segment where I'm sort of making fun of entertainment tonight and access Hollywood and those kind of shows. And they said, okay, let's give that a try. And sure enough, it quickly became one of the, you know, more, more popular bits or segments on the show. It went from being once a day to, I think, once an hour, we ended up doing it by, at the end. And, and that's how people learned who I was. And so it's that kind of mentality where the, the, the management, and this is true in most creative enterprises, the, the people who are in charge who aren't creatively minded just live in fear. And so everything is fear-based. Like, no, you can't speak because no one knows who you are. And that we, uh, this is, you're going to rock the boat and don't do this and don't do that. And so we were told early on, you know, tone it down. You're talking too long. The segments are too long. We need more music. Nobody wants to hear anybody talk. I mean, I went to K-Rock with Hollywood Babylon. Kevin Smith and I recorded a pilot show for K-Rock. And I said, give us your worst time slot. I don't care if it's two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Although I think it was Rodney's time slot. But um, <laughs> whatever your worst two hours is, give me that. Let us do this show in that. And I guarantee you that we will, you'll see an uptick in the ratings. So I gave them this pilot thing and management said, this is awful. Nobody wants to hear people talk on the radio. They only want to hear music and get in and out. And you guys are just talking about stuff and making jokes and going on and on. Nobody wants to hear that. Now, this is pre-podcast days, okay? When, yeah. when podcasting really wasn't the thing. But could they have been more wrong when you look at the world now with podcasting where everybody is just talking all the time? It's just talk. And people yeah. love it. And they're tuning in mm -hmm. in droves because the, the bottom line is, Content is king. And if you're saying something that's interesting, it doesn't matter the format or how polished it is or how many bells and whistles you put on it. People will listen. And now radio is dying because there's no personality in it anymore. And podcasts are, are thriving because it's all personality based. So they're idiots, I guess, basically is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Adam like Carolla what... has the best stories about how dumb program directors are. One of my favorites is... Somebody told him, oh, that Jimmy Kimmel guy, he's a behind the scenes guy. He can't be on the air. Don't put him on the air. So yeah. that's how smart those guys are. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it seems like at any given opportunity, they will make the wrong choice. Well, yeah. that's everywhere. Like Blockbuster having the chance to buy Netflix. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's a lack of vision that is usually the downfall for most big enterprises. And, uh, and K-Rock was no different. And I mean, just look what the new owners have done to that station in terms of getting rid of uh, people. And, and just yeah. it's 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 been sad for me to watch. But, and, you know, it's funny. I said this to Kevin Smith, I don't know, a couple of years after they had let me go. I said at the time, I felt like I was being over, thrown overboard of like a, a cruise ship. Like I was on a cruise and they grabbed me and they threw me overboard. I said, little did I know. I landed in a lifeboat because I had a head start. I started doing my own show before the whole thing for the wheels came up and the whole thing came crashing down. So I was already, you know, a couple of years ahead of the curve before it all uh, burnt to the ground. So in, in reality, I think they did, did me a favor. Yeah. You were the guy that missed getting on the Titanic. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Well, I've always told these guys, cause I have a bunch of emails I saved where you said, Oh, this is listener Edwin. We should give him a job. Now, if you had done that, I would already be fired by Intercom and, and I'd be over it. <laughs> That's true. You would be you'd be over it. Je you've brought up Jeffrey Dean Morgan, George yes. Clooney, especially on the last one. The more you guys are going to, you know, once you meet, you guys are going to be best friends. I've told these guys that once I re meet Ralph Garman, that's 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 right there. Best friends going on. All right. Fair enough. We got to we gotta, look. The pandemic's coming to a close. Are you a drinking man? Do you like to have a cocktail? I got the Jack Daniels barrel <laughs> proof right here. Look, try to stop these guys from drinking. We're already friends just by you showing that bottle. We've we've yeah. already cleared the first hurdle. So yeah, at some You're, point we'll we'll sit down and we'll share it. We'll share a cocktail and we'll we'll see where things go. go. Now that the pandemic's over, we've also been wondering what's next coming up for the Ralph Report and for Hollywood Babylon. Ideally, we're going to get back in front of the audiences again. Um, the improv comedy club here in LA, where we did both Hollywood Babylon and several live Ralph reports, they're 
starting to fill their rooms again. It's only, I don't know, I think they're uh, at 75 people now versus the 200 they usually take. And they're, they're requiring vaccination cards to get in. But it's a step in the right direction. And, and the minute, you know, we can kind of put something together, we definitely want to start doing live shows again because that's, that's the victory lap. You know, you, you work your ass off all week long and you put the show out there. And then once in a while, you get to do it in front of the people who love it. And plus Steve flies in from England and we get to be all together as a group. And it's just, it's just a blast. I think that first show especially is just going to be, every, I mean, like a reunion party is what it's going to feel like. Yeah. So I think that'll be really cool. It's going to be New Year's Eve and uh, St. Patrick's Day <laughs> all rolled into <laughs> one. one. Everybody's so pent up. I think they're just dying to uh, to blow off a little steam. So yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to those first shows. If I can't sell out that show, I'll never be able to sell out a show. I think. <laughs> It'll be Kevin and being drunk by noon or vomit by noon. <laughs> now, speaking of which, um, we did have a show with Miss Cleo where she reacted to a bunch of clips. I from- watched that show. That was great. Yeah. So we were going to ask you because we know you um, you bought a horse, perhaps um, if you have any memories or non memories from that fateful morning. <laughs> Come on. How much do you think I remember from that show? I remember a reggaeton horn. <laughs> I remember. Was that the show where Kevin couldn't get anything right about? Uh, um, That's all of them. That was, was all it? shows. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> it was Kirkman who was coming on yeah. to do Walking Dead, and he kept calling him Kingman or something. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and uh, oh, what else? <clears throat> there was a slew of like, because Bean wasn't there, so Kevin was trying to do all the heavy lifting with announcing the guests and everything. And it was just a slew. I just remember him going through a stream of mistakes that just <laughs> slayed me. Uh, so I remember that. I do remember it being in the back room, being offered uh, part ownership in a racehorse. I do remember that. I remember saying yes. <laughs> and I remember the next morning waking up and realizing what I'd done and quickly getting on the phone to those people and pulling out of that deal. Oh, um, what else? What else do I remember from that? show? I remember Omar being t- thrown uh, thrown out for being behind the bar. I remember that vividly. <laughs> And the rest is just sort of a uh, a Jameson soaked haze. What so, about the aftermath? How much trouble did you guys really get into? Oh, it, it's amazing how little the the brass at K Rock liked us. How little they enjoyed the show. No one hated the show more than the people who were paying us to put it on. It was they the more fun that we had, and the more fun the audience had the less they liked it, it seems like to me. I could never understand that. They, they would did everything they could to discourage the, the uh, certainly the live shows. I don't think we ever did another live show after that, or it was years later because they said it was just unlistenable. And my defense to that always was, yes, they're not the best show to listen to. Oh, but awesome. we but <laughs> we didn't do them that often. And I thought that kind of event broadcasting made people get that FOMO, you know, that like, oh, that sounds like such a blast. I wish I was there. Those guys are in the middle of something that's very exciting. And I thought that aspect of it had real value. I wouldn't do a show like that every day, but, you know, for, for Cinco de Mayo or for, for uh, St. Patrick's Day or when we used to do the Miss Double December contest, those kind of events generated a certain excitement that people enjoyed. And I saw nothing wrong with sacrificing a little of the polish and making it sound a little hectic, a little crazy, a little sloppy to, to be able to have to own that. And then they, they took that all away from us, which was sad. Yeah, we were talking one time after we did the, the special about the St. Patty show. Those were our favorite shows. You're right. They weren't polished, maybe, but they were memorable. All the yeah. live shows, you felt like you were at a party. Right. And the, and the suits the, didn't get that. No, that you're absolutely right. The suits didn't like to party. They were not fun people. And so all they heard was noise and, you know, they're radio people and they didn't he- hear that polished sound. They wanted us to sound like Ryan Seacrest. And we were sounding oh like like a drunken, debauched group of uh, of, in- of maniacs. And that was a much more K-Rock experience than yeah. the, something that would have been, you know, well produced or something. It is so you know, radio got produced to death where 
everything sounded like everything else. And I think the, the true strength of Kevin and Bean, and this is all on them, has nothing to do with me because it, it was what they had when they first started and it's what they had after I was gone. But they never sounded like a bullshit radio. It didn't sound like Rick Dees or Seacrest or Mark and Brian or any of those just pre-packaged, produced to death shows that sounded like every other show. It was it was raw and it was real and it was unique. And that was the strength, I think, of, of those guys. So speaking of uh, a time when you thought on your feet, um, we have a baby little game to play. Um, and you probably you may not remember all of these stories, <laughs> but there was a segment of the showbiz beat in uh, November 16th, 2011, where there was just a commercial for BMW with the <laughs> Mission Impossible theme in the background. Okay. And because of that, you got so excited that you said, I want to I want to say all of my stories with the Mission Impossible theme. So here's there's a couple of clips and I'll stop them and ask you a couple of questions. So here we go. All right. 106.7 K Rock is K R O Q and it is 20 minutes till 10. It's a curious choice. Is that what that sounds like? We just uh, we just showed a uh, uh, we just played a commercial for BMW and they're already working in the uh, Mission Impossible angle. Can't wait for that. Apparently movie. the Beamers are featured in that movie and I just kind of wait for that movie and that theme just gives me a pup tent. So do you remember? <laughs> this is 2011. Do you remember which Mission Impossible? Yes, a pup tent. Um, which Mission Impossible this was? I, no, I don't remember this this experience. I, this is all as if someone else is talking. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep going. All right. It is yeah. it's one of the great themes. It of is all one time. of the great themes. Now it's it in is. my head, and now it won't go anywhere. Yeah. Although the title con concerns me, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Yeah, because it sounds like. Well, let's just slap some words at the end of the title and make it sound cool. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, you know what we got, what we got anything. What the protocol is? Uh, Mission Impossible, Capricorn Neutron. <laughs> <laughs> Mission Impossible, <laughs> Diode Symphony. <laughs> they're, cutting them all they're cutting them all loose, man. Uh, they're cutting them all loose. Denying protocol. all knowledge. Sounds like a BS buzzword to me. <laughs> 19 minutes. Good luck. <laughs> Top of the hour, 10 o'clock this morning. <laughs> Should Ralph? you choose to accept your mission? <laughs> Gonna have to move on. <laughs> I want that to be a new showbiz uh, theme. All right. Can we do a new showbiz bed with Mission Impossible underneath it yeah. instead of uh, instead of the BS. That's entertainment. Can we get uh, can we get something cool under there? Make oh, it sound a little more important. <laughs> there we go. Now it sounds important. Okay, so there are three different stories that you gave Mission Impossible taglines. So I'm you, sure you won't you hear, remember. Can you hear how annoyed Bean is with me? Yes, very annoyed. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to play the tagline and I'll play it twice and we can see if you remember the story. I'm sure you won't. I wouldn't. But here we go. <laughs> All right. Mission Impossible, British douchebag. Mission Impossible, British, British douchebag. douchebag. Um, the subject of the story I'm going to say was uh, Piers Morgan. No. Oh. Simon Cowell's a diva. Oh, Simon Cowell. <laughs> the National Enquirer reports that Simon Cowell made a stink recently in a restaurant when he sent back the water the server brought over because it had ice in it. He returned his meal without taking a bite. All right, so that's story one. And these I should stories... have said Cal, of course. It was back when American Idol was hot. Okay, my bad. <laughs> these stories get progressively more bizarre as, as we go on. So All here's right. the second one. <laughs> Mission Impossible, third nipple. Can you pinch it? Mission Impossible, third nipple, <laughs> subcolon, can you pinch it? Third nipple? Um, geez. Uh, who has a, who has a superfluous nipple? Um, uh, I, I got nothing. Okay. Mark Wahlberg has a third nipple. Uh, and he doesn't like it to be pinched. Apparently, work of art host China Chow hey! was recently on Bravo's Watch What Happens Live when Andy Cohen asked China if she used to dig Mark and if he could give her any details. She said, other than his third nipple, and he doesn't like it played with. He doesn't like nipple pitching at all. <laughs> I can't believe people are still talking about Mark Wahlberg's third nipple. I mean, hasn't this been something we've all known about for about 20 years? Not me. <laughs> Knowing about his third nipple for me was a mission impossible. I don't know that this theme is good for Ralph Showbiz Pete. Uh, okay. 
This, this makes me laugh so hard still. Um, last one, the most bizarre one ever. Mission Impossible, boyfriend misidentified. <laughs> Inquirer reports. Oh, sorry. Mission Impossible, boyfriend misidentified. Boyfriend misidentified. Boy, no, I, I'm really lost now. This this is a weird one. Okay. Right. Carrie Fisher, formerly of Star Wars fame, talks about her father, famous Eddie Fisher, and the fact that they used to do drugs together. He was a great person, but a terrible parent, yes. <laughs> By the end of his life, she said he was smoking a lot of drugs, losing it mentally, and thought the man she was dating was Barack Obama. <laughs> what? He was so drug-addled, he believed her boyfriend was... Barack Obama. Okay, what's happening now? Mission Impossible. Boyfriend misidentified. So that that is our baby little game show. That is um, funny. Yeah. I don't remember a bit of that, but it is funny to me to hear how uh, furious Bean is getting because we're off the rails. Honestly, though, you put like an entire segment together on the fly like that. That's just like fear. Fear is is a powerful fuel. <laughs> Every time those mics would go live, I would just, uh, you get this rush of energy and adrenaline, and it does magical things to your brain sometimes. But it, it's also, you know, so much about Mission Impossible. You know, so much about <laughs> old TV shows and just that whole genre. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good at replicating, uh, you know, genre kind of things, whether it's an old timey newscaster from the 1930s. I mean, I can do voices like that, so I can fall back on those things sometimes when I need a, a shtick. So I was able to do a Mission Impossible type announcer guy. Um, I have one last question, which is, do you have any kind of bizarre in real life experiences that came from being famous um, that you you haven't talked about? Famous is a, is a qualified word there, I'll have you know. Um, no. Yeah. I know famous people, trust me. There's a big difference between them and me. Um, well, well, there was the time I, I had uh, sex on my birthday in a, in a motel room on the air. That was odd. That's something you couldn't do these days. I'll tell you that much. Definitely not. No. What? Um, yeah, they, uh, Kevin and Bean, uh, very early on, uh, put me in a hotel room and invited listeners to come down and have sex with me and some birthday cake. On my birthday that happened and i believe the lady is a listener of the ralph report i believe she is yes all not these she years, not be. all these years later <laughs> yes um anything happened in real life the one no, thing I'm... that i remember you talking about was that on your on the way to see your in-laws there was like a security guard at the airport that was like you're gonna have the worst time ever or something like that <laughs> oh, yes um, I would get recognized in strange situations. You know, what was always surprising to me is how often I got recognized from people who had their back turned to me. I would be at a bar having a conversation with someone and you'd see someone just wheel around and go, you're Ralph Garman. I was like, yeah. And he's like, I could hear it. I could hear it. That's how people would know me, <laughs> especially early on. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm trying to think there were, there were strange moments of being recognized. Um, but uh, but uh, almost always pleasant. I mean, no one really ever came up in, um, in in an inappropriate time or anything. I was always more than happy to talk to people because it's just you don't expect to be recognized at all when you do radio. So it's always, uh, you know, a pleasant surprise. After I did Joe Schmo and I had done a couple, uh, you know, and I did Ted and, and um, Million Ways to Die in the West and I did some television work. I did It's Bobby, which is right behind you right now uh, on house. <laughs> Um, then, you know, especially people who listened eventually got to know my face. So it wasn't nearly as surprising, but early on in particular, it was very odd. Nice. Well, I can't thank you enough. We all can't thank you enough for joining our little podcast and what a pleasure. Um, thank you for I'm asking. So glad. Me. Well, and yeah, this has been great. You've been the first actual other than this Cleo was an intern. So you're our actual first celebrate or host of the show that we've had on so we can't thank you enough but this has just been so thrilling and exciting for all of us it was an absolute pleasure and we'll do it again sometime because 
you know, you're talking about my favorite subject here. I know. know? So <laughs> how could I, how could I not have a good time? <laughs> right. <laughs>